the following conversation is with retired U.S. Navy SEAL Mike Sorelli. Mike served in SEAL Team 3, Task Unit Bruiser, the most decorated special operations task unit of Iraq of the Iraq War, where he led many major combat missions. Mike Sorelli is a subject matter expert in the area of leadership and human performance. In 2020, Mike became a best-selling author with the release of his book, The Talent War, How Special Operations and Great Organizations Win on Talent. This definitive guide helps businesses and business leaders develop world-class talent by tapping into the assessment and selection process used by the U.S. Special Forces. In my opinion, Mike Sorelli is a hero. He would probably disagree with me. You can connect with Mike and his team at talentwar.com. Enjoy. He's uh, been around for decades and uh, people said it just can't be done, especially if you don't have a private jet. Well, nine veterans, mostly special operations guys came together. Well, which is to say I planned the entire thing for 18 months and uh, we did pull it off. We set four world records by doing it in six days, six hours and six minutes and proving uh, everyone wrong. And we did it on commercial air. So uh, we did it. Each continent was in honor of one of our fallen. So the documentary, which is filmed and docu or documented and produced, directed and produced by the guy who did the Blair Witch Project, which broke every indie record, still holds them. All right. Uh, did the film and... Uh, so it's it's adventure. It's the story of of amazing men who gave their lives for this country, as well as you know through the eyes of the men that knew them. Um, drama. So it's it's a lovely piece. We've gotten great feedback on it, and it got picked up for theatrical release. Great. And it's called Triple Seven. Triple Seven. They said it couldn't be done. Couldn't be done. And it's and it's you're not raising money. It's just honoring these men. No, we raised money for Folds of Honor. We raised okay. two million when we did it, and a good portion of the, the ticket proceeds go to Folds of Honor, plus everything we raised through just awareness. Uh, our ultimate goal is seven million, which would be fifteen no fourteen hundred scholarships for spouses and children of fallen and disabled uh, disabled uh, service members. Educational scholarships. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so let me ask you this, because. Uh, if you're in the military, if you're disabled, you obviously have the VA. And uh, I work with, I do some volunteer work for a couple of uh, veterans organizations. And, and one of the things that we emphasize, one of the things that we do is is help our our veterans access these these uh, benefits. That sometimes, you know, there's there sometimes they're hard to access because whatever the and then and then there's a lot of them. There's some that are specifically for the service person, and there's some for their families. So why raise money when these there is this access to veterans care? Uh, veterans care is not going to cover uh, benefits or education for uh, spouses and children. You can roll your Montgomery GI Bill over to one of your kids, uh, but that was that was like within the past decade that that changed happened. But whenever you go through the government, it's tedious. And yes, World well, of Honor approves these scholarships, and if they had more money, they'd approve as many as they can. And five thousand dollars is not you know forty thousand dollars, but it aids families who the service member if they're still alive and disabled. Is just having a rough go at it. Um, it just it takes a lot little pressure off the uh, the families. The reason we chose Folds of Honor is ninety one cents of every dollar, uh, and this is why they have platinum rating on all the the charity uh, navigator and the other the other uh, platforms that rate charities. That's why they have like a top rating because they put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, and for you people that don't understand this, I would say. Most of these large charities, the the cancer charities, the uh, you name it, a lot of these massive charities, 
maybe 20 cents, 30 cents for every dollar actually gets into the hands of the people they help. It, it's a very small amount. And and because they spend so much money uh, with their awareness campaigns and marketing and, and some of these charities pay uh, their CEOs goo gobs of money, which again, I don't, I don't hold that against them, but uh, a lot of people just don't understand. If you donate a dollar to most charities, that charity may actually get their hands on 20 or 30 cents of that dollar. And there, there's always the, the horror story and, and they're a good organization and they've, they've re they've reset, but the wounded warrior foundation had a CEO that was having these lavish uh, extravagant events and they found out that only like nine cents on the dollar were actually going to the programs, but they brought in all new leadership uh, and they're, they're doing great work. Hey, every organization stumbles from time to time, especially if you have a corrupt or unethical leader and um, they, they, they brought in some generals and, and it's, it's doing good work now. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I want, I want to say this, um, because I, I I love this quote and it's about you. It's it's uh, there are few men that I could count on without question and without hesitation, a hundred percent. Through all the horror and the fear and the pressure, there's always some guys I knew without a shred of doubt that would stand beside me and hold the line no matter what. They would never let me down ever. And Mike Sorelli is one of them. Mike. This is the part I really love. Mike has done more for me and for this for the teams and for our great nation in the world that the world is ever going to know. And that is by your buddy Jocko Willink. That's high praise. I I I have not heard that. Um and, and I I I appreciate that. Uh, I'm probably uh not as deserving of those comments, but um appreciative. Well, I, you know what, Mike, I, and I think that generally speaking, when you look at the Navy SEALs and the special ops, there is a lot there that goes on that we as civilians will never know. That it, it, it's, it's, it's just something that is that uh, we, we, we don't hear about, you know, uh, let me rephrase it. A lot of times we don't hear about when a Navy SEAL uh, dies in combat. We we don't hear about what their sacrifices that you guys go through. We don't hear, uh, certainly we don't hear about the mission. So it's, it's, it's such a, what do you call it? It's such, it's such an important thing. I say, do you have a, a pet? I see you. <laughs> you can hear my uh, Dutch Shepherd, which is a breed we used in the military. There's somebody dropping off the package. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. I have my little dog here, and uh, she she sometimes will start whining for no reason. So it's okay. It's okay. okay. <laughs> it's a un friendly un show. You hear that, Ben? Come here. <laughs> all right. He's uh, no, no, no. He he does his job. Um, you know, and that's what this documentary is about. This this triple seven is you know one legacy expeditions is the the, the company the overarching company. Uh, which we could, you know, our motto is expeditions in honor of our fallen. Um, it hurts when you lose one of these guys, which you consider your brothers. And then it just keeps hurting when you remember the caliber of the men they were. Um, and, you know, to give you one example, I jumped in Antarctica in honor of Michael Monsoor, who was just an amazing individual, quiet. And remember, all these men are flawed, just just sure. as are you and I. But to be able to stand and, and, and be willing to die for something is a rare commodity these days. And he jumped on a grenade that came into our position. Uh, and I was three feet from him. And another SEAL was three feet to his left. And without hesitation, he looked my direction, yelled grenade, and then jumped on it and absorbed the majority of the blast. Um and was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor about two years later. And, you know, these men, again, flawed men, common men, showed uncommon selfless valor on a nightly basis and would have went on to do amazing things 
to 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 impact their community. And, and if Mikey came from a family who where every uh, male has served, they're quiet. Uh, actually, a Lebanese uh, family, uh, Christian Lebanese, um, which just shows the diversity of of our uh, of our, our country and our armed forces. But we look at what's going on in society, and I'm not going political here with what I call these reindeer games and a lack of civility and professionalism. These, these guys were kind, they were respectful, they were empathetic. Yeah. Did they do a dirty job? Yes. But they treated people with such, just such grace. And if we treated each other like that, then this country would be a better place. And, and we want those stories to be told. And we want to remind people that freedom isn't free. It comes at a high cost, but you know, 1% of our, our, our military, or I'm sorry, 1%, of our populace actually serves. And if I walked up to an average American on the street and say, name somebody who died in Iraq or Afghanistan, they, they, they just, they couldn't name someone. Right. And we have to remember that. Um, and, and guys, we can solve any problem that this country has when we come together and put all the, the BS aside and just say, Hey, what's the right answer here? And what is, what is the ethical logical answer here? and move forward. And that's different for, for different situations, but just such uh, amazing men. And uh, there's also survivor's guilt. You you come back and there is a element of survivor's guilt that you just never get over. Maybe it gets easier with time, but you know, I think about him or all the guys that died uh, on extortion 17, which were my former teammates, uh, the largest single loss of life incident in Afghanistan when 31 Americans were killed just amazing human beings in the country is not better off for having lost them. And, uh, that's, that's war. War is stupid, but war is necessary as long as humans exist and evil reigns and evil, you know, lurks in certain places. Men have to go forward and try to eradicate that evil. And, um, these men were willing to raise their hand and go. Right. And I want to point this out. One of your your best selling book is about talent. And we're going to get into that. Not only is war stupid. But I'm grateful for the men and the women who are willing to put their life on the line. A shout out to my daughter. Um, and uh, she's a, with a medical unit. Uh, and uh, she's a. Um, uh, a petite little girl. She's a hundred pounds. You know, she's a hundred pounds or 110 pounds soaking wet. And as a proud father, when, when she's got that rucksack on and, you know, it weighs probably half as much as she does, it's an amazing thing. And the, the leader that she has become um, and, and the changes that you see her, uh, that you see these young people go through, it is absolutely amazing. And so I'm grateful for people like yourself and my daughter that are good at what they do because you need good people in, in a war. Bert, you know, everyone naturally goes to the combat arms or special operations because I, I guess that's, that's the sexy thing that ends up in movies. But you know what I, I was proud of a majority of my guys, not all is that they treated what we call that combat, those combat support personnel with such respect because we got to do what we did, which actually argu arguably going to, to capture or kill a, a, a terrorist was the easiest part, but it was the logistics specialist, the Intel person who was reading 500 pages a day to arm us with the information we needed. Um, the, the admin people that made sure that your life was taken care of in terms of pay and benefits and everyone played a part and it was, a bunch of 110 pound uh, young ladies who patched me back together when I had 30 holes in my legs from the grenade where Mikey was killed. Yeah, I'm not kidding. It was a 110 pound doctor who from uh, Texas A&M who I had to go in for three months straight to debris my my wounds so that you know it they leveled out and and healed and and everyone plays a part. And so congratulations to your daughter. Yeah, the military is it's a leadership incubator and yes. it'll turn a young girl or, or a boy into a, a man or, or woman with a mindset and a code. And, and what people get wrong 
is that in there are some people that, that beat their chests and talk about their kill count. Um, and we didn't have a, 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 a good taste for, for those type of guys. They do exist. And I call that the lowest common denominator, but warriors are trained in the art of war, but they're in the profession of peace and warriors prevent wars. That's our goal is to appear to be so strong that nobody wants to fight us. Um, but that is a, the biggest misconception that people think the military just wants to go forward and kill people. No, we're very good at that. But uh, when you do that, arguably, it breaks you as a human, mentally, spiritually, physically. And uh, I had a good buddy who said a great line. He said, war leaves a fingerprint that can never be washed off. And those people are never the same. Now, just because you're broken, does that mean you can't come back and do amazing things? And, and there are thousands upon thousands of stories of veterans who've come back from war and started companies or are in, in elected positions or are running nonprofits that are just doing impactful work. And that's those those are the military veterans that that I know. And they are they're not broken. When society says we're broken, that's sort of ironic coming from a society that's in disrepair and broken itself. So, uh, yeah, right on. Good. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Well, first of all. If you've made it through high school here in America, you're broken. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, I don't know about your high school, but my high school and every high school that I've seen, and even some of the private high schools, you, you go through a, a certain level of hazing and bullying. And, and there's this, this thing where you're trying to fit in and, and you're trying to figure out your, who you are. And, and and I think it's hysterical that the at the age of 18, we're going to tap this kid on the shoulder and say, okay, make your lifelong decision. What do you want to do for a living? What? I have no experience, no, no skills in making a decision. I have, I don't even know who I am, but I think we're all broken. And, and, and the reason I can say that, uh, because it takes on average, the average human doesn't find out who they are or what they want till about the age of 35. It takes us that long to get over whatever is holding us back. And, and some people do it sooner, but I'm saying on average, you're looking at 35 to 40 before they sh before we're able to shed society and deal with whatever is holding us back or whatever you want to call it. So we're yeah. all broken. It, well, I guess I'm in the uh, the 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 long tail on the, uh, the other spectrum of uh, the bell curve because I'm 46 and I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do. Um, oh, I loved, I, so when people say, Hey, do you miss the, uh, the military? I, I say, I don't miss the circus, but I miss the clowns. Um, uh, <laughs> they, there's the military is still government and there's some infuriating incompetence, but, uh, you know, as you look at high schools and I, there are so many ways to create a better, better program. Yes. I don't believe in kids going direct to college. I think in general, Stanley McChrystal advocated that for this, um, that young men and women go work for two years in a, a, a variety of roles to identify what their passion is. Cause at 18, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And then additionally, you know, the greatest education, I, I fully believe this is world travel. And I'm not yes. talking to Paris and Rome. I'm talking to, other in the trenches, other world countries, it, it, not not in harm's way, but in seeing how the other world lives. I mean, one of the how old was I? Forty four when I went to Nepal, and that was one of the most spiritual educational trips to see people that have very little, but are so grateful for what they have. And we we need to do a better job. And then additionally, teachers need to be paid more. If oh my gosh! Got paid more, you would attract a different level of talent into the teacher pool like people who are competent, who are ethical, who are great coaches and mentors that could really reinforce critical thinking for, for these young men and women who deserve, deserve it. But yeah, education is a, is we are so behind other countries. It's, 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 it's not even, it, it's sickening. And especially with the critical thinking and not indoctrinating kids one way or the other, let them come to that conclusion on their own, but challenge them to think critically about both sides of an argument. Absolutely. And I would add, not only do we need to pay our teachers more, but they need to be held accountable. Look, if, if you and I are working 
and, and we're doing a crappy job. We're going to be held accountable. Maybe we get written up once or twice, but eventually we get let go. Teachers need to have the same fire, the same accountability, bring their passion. But look, if you're unhappy being a teacher, which a lot of teachers get burnt out and I get that, it's time for you to go. If you're no longer effective, move on. Tenure is one of the worst concepts I've ever heard of. If, you know, could you imagine in the military or a business, a CEO steps into a, a seat and, and he's like, hey, I'm, I'm tenured. You can't fire me. No, you're not performing. You're gone. And no, there are very few industries that have tenure because you have to continue to perform. Right. Bottom line, it's in, in, in people talk about, well, my company needs to be loyal to me. Well, that's a two way street. You also need to be loyal to your company. And if you are, hopefully both 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 ways are, are operating at full speed. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't care what industry you're in, you're in the business of performance. And if you don't perform, you've got no no credibility, no argument to, to remain in that position whatsoever. Absolutely. I agree. We as humans are about more. And it's not just, uh, you know, a lot of people get hung up when they see these really wealthy people and they make more money and they just like to focus on, man, how much money do you need? That's just one measurement. But, you know, can you get more physically fit? Can you get can you increase your intelligence? Can you increase your speech, spirituality? Uh, you talked about, you know, giving the community. Can you give back to the community more It as humans? We're a reflection of the universe, and I'm a big believer that the universe is about more. What's the next step? What What are you going to do now? Great. You, you, you just accomplished that. Let's celebrate that. Let's take a couple of days off. But what's the next thing? Otherwise, you die. There's no point being on the planet. Evolution. Evolving. Evolution. So, you know, what I really, it, who I was when I joined, and I started in the Marine Corps before I went into the SEALs, uh, you know, didn't graduate high school with my class not from a lack of, of aptitude, is there was just no focus. If it didn't involve girls, booze, or parties, I, I just wasn't focused. And I don't say that to, to be flippant. Um, it's just who I was at the time. I wanted to have right. fun. And went into the Marine Corps, and my dad, who I did not see eye to eye with, and ends up he was right on 99% of the things he was trying to teach me, said another, an, like a completely different human being came out of Marine Corps boot camp. And then the, after a few years, the Marine Corps said, hey, we want to make you an officer. We're going to send you back to school. And this was before the war. I went from making a 2.9 in high school, which most of my GPA was because I played sports and they give you an A for playing sports. Um, I graduated A&M with like a 3.65 honors. I assure you, I didn't get smarter during that period of time. And to your point, going and doing something other than, than go, being 18 and going direct to college was so valuable when I stepped back into college at the age of uh, 23 or, or, or 22 with maturity, with a sense of discipline and accountability. And it was a completely different uh, experience. So, you know, it, there's just, I think psychology, this is what I say. Psychology by nature is lazy. It defaults to the path of least resistant. As we get older, this is for people in the thirties, forties, fifties, sixties that, you know, we tend to just want things to be the same. Right. Well, if you fall in that category, then you stop evolving. You stop being relevant to the people around you. Impact is the greatest currency in life. And ultimately, you know, I just want to be able to answer this one question when I'm on my deathbed. Was I a net positive to society, my family, and those around me in the end? And right. I hope the answer is yes. But what I loved about special operations was when we accomplished something big, guys would celebrate for that night, usually involved booze. Um, it's just, it was, we, we liked to drink in the military. It was, it was something we rallied around, um, not alcoholics. Um, the next morning was, okay, what's the next challenge? And even if one of our operations made it into the, 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 the front page of every, uh, every newspaper across the world, it was what's next, what's next. But more, I mean, I'll, I'll say this, after each operation, win or fail, we did sit there and say, okay, what did we learn? What do we need to do better? What do we need to stop doing and and, and, and move forward from there? You know, it's uh, something that you said a little while ago uh, just sparked this 
the thought I've met, I've been fortunate enough to meet many Navy SEALs uh, because again, the, the work that we do with the uh, veterans organizations, uh, uh, some of my clients are MMA champions. Uh, and you said something about some of the strongest people or, or you hinted to something about uh, some of the, you know, about, about loudness and, and some of the, I've never met a loud Navy SEAL. I've never met a, a really conceited uh, Navy SEAL confident, absolutely, but very quiet. Uh, same thing with uh, my MMA clients. Uh, these guys could, you know, could do a lot of damage, but they, they're not puffed up. They're very easygoing. They're usually the quietest guy in the room. And, and unless you get in their face and they have to deal with you, they're, they're going to walk away. You, and, you, you've not met that many Navy SEALs then. Okay. Because uh, we have them out there. <laughs> Well, uh, sure. And, Every group's yeah, going to have you know, a couple. No, no, no. Trust me. We, we've got okay. them out there. Okay. And, and, and that's why, you know, I, I've written two books and by no means are they war books whatsoever. Like, so right. there I was surrounded or uh, up to my neck in gr grenade pins holding off the enemy. I'm, I'm just not going to do that because every victory we had on the, uh, the battlefield wasn't because of me. It was because of the amazing team I had around me. And that's pretty much every accomplishment in my life. But like, the loudest guys, and we had them in the SEAL teams, usually were did the le least on the battlefield. Um, and the other thing, too, is is I don't care what you do. Be careful on the way up and how you treat people because you're going to see those same people on the way down. Yes. And I'd rather be quiet and, and you know, let my actions speak volumes than my words. I mean, it's the old, like, we always had a sign doing greater sign, greater sign talking. Like at the end of the day, especially this day and age, everyone has a freaking microphone and everyone is just running their mouths. But what is your credibility? Show me what you've done. Have you been able to been, be, take that and be successful in a completely different domain? Uh, or are you a one trick pony who, who met with some success at some point? You just, you got to be careful. And, and that always, that doesn't come from, it comes from the military and great leaders above me, but it also comes from my old man and my mom. They were just like, just always be humble, hungry, smart, and just, just let your accomplishments speak for themselves and other people speak for you, not, not, not yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think humility is currently missing in our, in our political arena there is uh it's an unfortunate thing interestingly enough you look at the loudest people in our politics are usually the people who are doing the least and it's 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 creating this massive uh uh what do you call it uh division nothing's getting done it, it, and and i, I want to talk about this i'm going to come back to it i i do want to ask you this real quick you're going through buds what was the hardest part for uh, for you at going through buds uh you know you for the for the audience you got to understand i was a recon marine and a scout sniper and i'd done very well in the marine corps finished honor man out of many courses to include marine ocs physically uh i you know i was i was fine it's going to challenge you buds is tough but i had a marine mentor he was what we call a mustang he was prior enlisted and became an officer and he actually discharged me as a sergeant and commissioned me as an ensign in the Navy the same day. And, you know, we're walking back to, to the ROTC building. He said, Mike, can I give you a piece of advice? And I said, yeah. And he said, if you quit buds, you'll embarrass the Marine Corps. And literally we start laughing. I think I've got tears coming out. I'm laughing so hard. And, you know, it was a joke, but there was an element of truth. So I very much knew I was representing the, the Marine Corps because I, I just, I, I, I acted like a Marine, um, held myself like a Marine and I focused on buds in leading and especially leading when things were going hard. And I, I you know, point of pride is Dr. Johnny Kim, who's this famous yes. Yes. <laughs> who became an astronaut in a, in a, in a Harvard educated doctor. He was in my buds class. And I think on a podcast or two, he said, you know, we leaned on Mike during the hard times. And he, he respected me for stepping up when guys just needed a little bit of motivation. Sometimes that motivation was when we were getting just beat down, not physically. And the instructors were just pushing us is standing 
up and just yelling the words F you to the instructors and getting back down. And the guys would just, you, you know, it, always those small things just to say, Hey guys, we, we've, we've got this. So, uh, the, the the biggest challenge was was having the courage and the the endurance to step up when the guys needed you to step up and just say hey this this sucks right now but we've got this and guess what they can't stop the clock that's the whole thing about buds they can't stop the clock uh, buds was challenging but by far not the most challenging thing I went through in the military uh, not even close really wow yeah uh, uh, now I don't know if they did this when you got involved with with navy seals but my understanding is now they have like a navy seal prep program to get you ready for buds are you familiar yes. with it okay and, and so did you go through that program or was that after you that, that was after me and it was it was a, it was a great idea um here here's the I, I was just i spoke at a conference in orlando yesterday and a, a guy came up and he's just like so you know you guys try to get as many students to quit in buds as possible and I had an opportunity to go back to Buds for like six or eight months as a as an instructor, mainly for the uh, for teaching the uh, the young officers that made it through. But no, the goal is that if 250 Buds candidates, SEAL candidates, step into training, our goal is that 250 graduate. Now, is that a reality? No, because we know that the training is tough. But that's the goal. So we 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 started to get smart, both physiologically and psychologically, of. How can we prep these young men to actually succeed in buds? That's what we want. And I don't have the data to see how success how successful that was in increasing the the amount that made it through, or or as we say, lowering lowering the the attrition. But um, for the public, if 250 and everyone who gets into buds is a stud. They're studs, and I admire anyone for having the courage to try. And even if you didn't make it, you know what? at least you had the guts to try. And for that, I will always hold you in esteem. But the whole goal is to get as many students through as possible, because guess what? That's more good men that can go forward to, 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 to assist in projecting our strength and protecting innocence in other country. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like that. Uh, all right. So here you are, you're, you, you've gone through buds, then you've come back to be a teacher if I was going to go through buds, what would you say would be the number one characteristic that I need to bring or to have to get me through buds? Because as you said, the physicality, if you're, you know, you're in pretty good shape. So that's not going to be an issue for a lot of people in the military. They're young and they're hard. I mean, they're just in the best shape of their lives, but you still get them, you, you still get them quitting. So what's the characteristic? If it's not physicality, what is it? So the mind will quit long before the body does. The, the, like the physiological nature of the body, the body can keep going. So your mind. And to narrow it down from there is resilience. Resilience is one of the number one attributes we're looking for. The training is designed, no matter how much of a stud you are, for you to fail. And when we see a student begin to fail, it's like blood in the water. So that's when the, the instructors will move over like a, 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 a school of sharks, if, if that's the right term, and wait for that, that student to get, uh, get up and then proverbially find a way to push them back down. And when you start to fail and fail and fail, naturally, we know mentally, most people just start to spiral and they want to see how you react. And I had one of these days in Buds and it was actually post Hell Week after I'd made it through the, the, the famous Hell Week. Blood sugar was low, didn't sleep that night, was dehydrated. And we had an evolution where like we were just climbing the rope for, for 30 minutes. And, and there's a line you'd climb back up. And I've climbed the rope a thousand times before I went to Bud because I was in the Marine Corps, you know, very confident at it. And I couldn't get up the rope. Wow. And the instructors came around me and the students are like, because because I, I had the respect of the other students just because I was prior enlisted. And, and the instructors start to yell at me and, and start applying pressure. And I just kept get, getting up. I'd jump back up on the rope, try to, to climb, and I'd fall back off. And uh, that went on for about 10 times until the, the instructors said, hey, stop. And they're like, come with us. And I'm like, oh, shit. Here, here we go. Um, and they pull me aside. 
And I think there's three instructors because the other instructors had to go monitor and they said, Hey, uh, are you feeling okay? And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not feeling great. And they're like, okay, we're, we're going to send you to medical, but we, we want to, we want to talk about this real quick. Do you think we, we, we doubt your ability to climb that rope, which you've shown you have the ability to, to do, uh, for the last, you know, eight weeks. I said, I, I, I guess not. And they're like, we wanted to see how you react. That was one of the first times we've seen you tr like truly start to fail at an evolution. And we applied the pressure to see how you would react. And we just want you to know that. So there is this big brother approach. Usually you see in buds, the, the instructors being pretty cruel. Um, now, nah, yeah, there's, there's times they do that and they do it extremely, extremely well, but then they'll pull you aside and they want you to learn from it. And that's what they did for me in that moment. And it was almost an aha moment for me in my maturation as a, uh, as a leader. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, and, and that's something that's interesting there because I wasn't expecting them to be testing your reaction, uh, your, your, I don't know, I guess, yeah, your reaction. That is something that, that is a complete surprise because you think that they, that uh, maybe they were, uh, uh, what do you call it? Just checking your skill, your physical skill. And, and the fact that they, they made you do it, like you said, 10 times. And after that, they said, Hey, are you okay? And we're just testing your, your patience, really, right? Your, your, your resilience to deal with, with this pressure situation, because it's not just you, but it's everybody watching you and all the pressure that they put you under for whatever that amount of time was. That's, that's a pretty cool point of view. It, and it is. And you know where, where the pressure was, wasn't, it probably was me thinking, oh, my guys are watching me. And it was that external fear of what are my guys thinking right now? rather than, you know, more internally driven. Um, and then, you know, I remember that story and I, did, did we put that in the talent war? Jesus, I forget at this point. I think we did, but um, no, it was, it was, I, I am who I am because I am a product of great coaches and mentors to include the buds instructors and everyone else that, that touched me at some point in my military career. But you just talk about if you have the ability to be introspective and reflect on everything you learn along the way, much like your daughter right now, like you come out of the military armed to be successful at whatever profession you choose. Absolutely. Uh, one of the, one of my favorite things when I talk to my daughter and she's stuck or, or whatever uh, she feels as though she's uh, being challenged. I always talk to her about if you can carry a 50 pound rucksack for 20 miles, <laughs> there are very few people who can do that. There are very few 110 pounders who are willing to go through that. And, and she did it with shin splints and the whole bit. And so uh, that's one of the great things about doing something that physically hard, because it's not only physically hard, but it's mentally hard. Like you said, the, the, the body's willing to quit, the mind's willing to quit it. And you have to sit there and say, no, I can do more. I can take a few more extra steps. And so just experiences like that, that you can fall back on and say, I did this. So I can do this other stuff too. It, and it's, everything is contextual. And, and, and I've got to stop and think about things now in the business world of, oh man, uh, the hard economic times, expenses are a little out of control. I've got aging accounts receivable. Uh, the funnel is not filling like it used to. And you feel like the world's coming, is just crushing, you know, caving down on you. And, and finding a way to tie my past experiences to say, okay, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, we're definitely struggling. What can I apply from my past experiences, what I've learned to get out of this dilemma right now? And rather than survive, actually start thriving. Um, and the more you fall, the more scars you have in life, it's what we call the growth mindset. And I talked about it in the, the, the Everyday Warrior, a no hack practical approach, which was about the men and women I served with. A growth mindset doesn't insulate you from hardship but it does prepare you to respond in a healthy and positive manner. And that's why all the failures in, in your life, all the, the cumulative failures just make you stronger and stronger and stronger. So I like when somebody says I'm broken, I'm like, you're damn right. I'm broken. I've got a hip replacement. Uh, but you throw any problem towards me and my guys, we'll find a way to, 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 to we, we have a slogan, no fail. We will right. not fail. We'll, we'll find a way to win. 
And even if we lose, yeah, it, you know, we didn't lose, we learned. So right. everything, it's God's way of saying, hey, this one didn't work out, but I just gave you one of the most valuable lessons you can take for, forward with you in the business world. Unfortunately, sometimes they're they're very costly mistakes. Absolutely. And I love this growth mindset because I think we were talking about the universe and expansion. That is, to me, a great uh, encapsulation of uh, of our time on planet Earth. It's having that growth mindset. If you have that growth mindset, then, like you said, you're either going to learn, you're going to succeed, you're going to try again. You're, you're. It's all an experiment. And sometimes I think people get so st stuck in success or failure when most of the time you're not going to become successful till you fail a few times. They're they're interactive. Hard choices lead to an easy life later on. Easy choices lead to a very hard life for, for your duration on this earth. So it's, and you've heard this, it's, let me say this. The reason we run SEAL training the way we do, uh, which is designed to push you outside your mental and physical comfort zone, is, is because that's where true character emerges. Uh, coincidentally, it's also where true learning and growth take place. So you've got, we call it do hard things. You've got to continually find ways to challenge yourself in order to evolve and learn. And the second you want to stop doing hard things, that's when you start to, to again, lose that natural curiosity that drive. You don't want things to change and remain the same. And that's just not life. Life is constant evolution. And the yes. second you stop doing that, you're, you're done. Yes. Doing hard things gives you that edge. It, it gives you a reason to get up early in the morning and, and crush it. it. If somebody's not excited about their life, it's because to your point, they're avoiding the hard things. They're, they're somehow we have been told or there's this covert programming or something's out there that we should avoid the hard things we should avoid the problems and only go for the easy and people do not understand like what you just said the hard things going and doing hard things makes life easier you gain self-confident and let me tell you a confident person isn't afraid they're not afraid of failing they're not afraid of trying again and they have that confidence that no matter what, we'll figure it out. Failure, failure is uh, life's greatest mentor, and and I don't say that uh, to belittle the actual coaches, mentors I've had in my life. But uh, failure is not an indictment of your character or worth as a human being. It just means you're human, and it's the mechanism through which true learning and growth take place. Uh, and there's there's a lot of historical examples, even in the military, military operations that were by textbook definition an absolute failure, but become watershed moments from which we learn so much as a military and society that we still utilize those lessons today. So that failure uh, long ago still is a reminder to current military members of like, hey, this is what we learned and don't do this. Don't replicate what we we did. Find another way to do it differently. So it is, it is again, mindset from an individual perspective is the most powerful thing in the world. Organizationally, organizational mindset is the foundation to culture. And if you can get people to adopt that mindset as 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 deep as you can within the organization, and will you always get people to adopt that that mindset, you know, 100 percent? No. But if you can get 60, 70, 80 percent of, of people to adopt that mindset and behave, you know, through their actions with routines and habits. Dude, you're you're gonna outmaneuver your competition any any day any day of the week and twice on Sunday, and that's hard. That's hard for business leaders because one, it, Bert, here's here's the secret, and you don't say uh, hear many military guys say this. Leading in the military was not as hard as leading in the private sector because my my guys and my gals went through one year of assessment and selection, bleeding, sweating, crying. Um, it, 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 there's a sense of pride and emotional buy-in that, that they come out the back end. And even if we disagree on something, we say, hey, we may disagree, but this is the mission. They're going to get it done. And, and you don't have that within the civilian sector because there's no sense of homecoming and belonging. There's, there's, there's a far lesser degree of pride in being 100% dedica dedicated to your organization and the mission. And so that's why business leaders have to accelerate at a different level than we do in the military and actually try to attain 
a higher level of leadership than is required with what we do. Um, and that's the challenge for a lot of organizations and a lot of, of private sector leaders. And that is, that's a tough nut to, to crack. Sure. I think a lot of that starts with the interview process. When you're going into the military, they ask you a set of questions and, and you got to take the ASVAP. And it, it, just just like like a lot of organizations in the military, if you raise your hand and say, listen, I don't want to do this or I can't do this, they'll show you the door. If if you were to start a company and and start asking those questions, hey, we we're our environment is about this mindset. And this is what we expect from our people. You're you're going to have less people interview for, for that position, but at least they're going to be somewhat aware of what is expected. And I think that expectations or standards are have become kind of wishy washy in the private sector. So there is a lot of governmental restrictions that come down that make it harder on on, on employers. But I will I will step back and correct you on one thing. So. To get into the military, those things you just uh, mentioned, the ASVAB and the questions, we call those requirements to get into the interview process. If you want to look at the SEALs, the actual interview process is the one year of basic underwater demolition school SEAL training. That's the interview process. And for the ones that make it through, we, we applaud them and say, hey, you're part of the team now. Congratulations, you just uh, passed the entrance exam. So what you do moving forward will determine your, your credibility and reliability uh, and reputation as a SEAL. Right. Um, I'm a firm believer in one, you, you have to have a systematic interviewing process that's actually looking for the attributes required for the job. And that's that that takes intention. Then the onboarding program. And this is a missed opportunity for businesses, a very robust onboarding program that, yeah, I'm talking get the HR practitioner stuff out of the way. This is we 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 pay people through ADP. This is also your benefits. Oh, submit you know, PTO through workday, things along those lines. Here's the what the evaluations look like. No, I want to get into the core values. I want to get into the mindset. I want to get into the history of the company. I want to get into behaviors, how you accelerate within the company. I want to make sure that's very understood. And if people need to memorize our values uh, verbatim, that then, hey, that's a requirement. I'm a believer that everyone should be on a 90-day assessment. And at the end of the 90 days, we're going to tell you whether you're you're a cultural alignment and a fit for this organization or not. But again, uh, there are certain concepts like DEI that I disagree with. Diversity, yes. Diversity of thought. Equity, everyone should feel like uh, uh, they have a, a sense of ownership in the company. Inclusion, yes. We want everyone to feel like they're a contributing member, but that requires the member to actually contribute. Um, right. So there, there, you know, 90 day periods, like, like legally, sometimes employers are constrained. And this is where, again, I said, I, I'm a small government guy. This is where government is getting in the way of companies And the backbone of our country is not democ democracy. It is actually free enterprise or capitalism. Capitalism. Yeah. It, it, if, if you want to, this is why people left feudalistic societies in the UK and move to America to start over where they controlled their own destiny and capitalism was the foundation of this country. And, and I think people get that wrong. And in the course, there's certain elements that will be, you know, think, Oh, Hey, he's this right wing nut. I, I'm a constitutional libertarian. I like I, both sides irritate me to hell. And I'm a centrist as well. I right. like to solve problems, not, 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 uh, you know, go off on a tangent and banter, uh, that is div uh, div divisive in, in nature. So, yeah, P we employers, I, 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 I feel their pain because they're always scared of ending up in a litigious uh, human resources, uh, you know, sort of lawsuit. And 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 after a while of of having to deal with those, people are just beat down, and they they allow mediocrity, standards, yes. and accountability are what drive cultures. If organizational mindset or mindset is the foundation, uh, you know, uh, accountability and standards are the pillars that erect from that. And if you don't have a culture of accountability, you have a culture, just not a culture that's worth a damn. Right. Absolutely. Because you'll never, ever overcome your culture. 
if you have a weak, crappy culture, your business is doomed. Uh, it, it, look, even if you have a really great culture, it's still hard. But if you have a weak, crappy culture, then your business is going to close. Uh, speaking of culture, speaking of talent, I do want to talk about your best-selling book. This is what got you on the best-selling bestsellers uh, list back in 2020. You came out with a book called The Talent War, How Special Operations and Great Organizations Win on Talent. So talk about this. Here you are. You're this military guy. What inspires you to write this book? Yeah, you know, to go from, from being a SEAL and in JSOC to all of a sudden in the human resources space was not a uh, uh, a leap that I, I, I had envisioned. But I started an executive search uh, firm with a friend uh, and also co-author George Randall. And we were, we were dedicated to putting veterans into small to medium-sized businesses. And we dealt with a number of companies. And I swear to God, we would put a candidate in front of them that was an Army Special Forces soldier, just a renowned human being that had no industry experience, but maybe 20 years in the military. And then they'd have another candidate who's a civilian, but maybe had eight years of, uh, of industry experience. And the employer would call us and be like, we love your candidate. He's so great. His mindset, his attitude, his character. But we're going to go with the other guy. And we'd ask why, and of course, you know, we're disappointed, but we, we, we'd we try to, to ask meaningful questions to better understand, to, to arm us, to sharpen our blade. And they're like, yeah, we just need somebody to step in and do the role. But even though our guy demonstrated or, or gal demonstrated that they're, they, they have, they're high in curiosity, they're high in trainability or learning. Um, and I swear to God, this happened probably a dozen times. The employer would call back three weeks, six weeks later and say, yeah, we made a bad hire. This guy who who we hired with industry experience is toxic and people like he's destroying the culture. And our next question would be, OK, it, hey, this happens. Bad hires happen. Uh, it's like some a batter that step, steps up to the plate. They're, they're, they're going to strike out more than they, they hit. And um, they would say, well, we're not going to do anything about it because I can't fire the guy because my boss will look at me and say, what are you guys doing down there? And they would stick with that person and allow the culture to to, to be tainted and George and I would have conversations. And then one day I, w I remember I was watching like uh, the housewives of something because my wife likes reality t TV. And I looked at my wife because I'm not paying attention. I said, I I've got to make a phone call. And it had to be about 7 p.m. And I called George and I'm like, we're writing a book to help small to medium sized businesses start selecting people based off attributes, you know, hungry, humble, smart that they can train to be the leaders they need within their organization. And that's what started the process. And, you know, I think two, two and a half years later, the book was done. Wow, that's incredible. It, but, it, you know, it makes sense to me, unfortunately, uh, that experience, they're going to go with this person that uh, has some experience in in, in that job. And, and, and in one sense, it kind of makes, it makes sense on one level, what I don't understand and what blows me away is for them to call you and say, hey, we made a bad hire, but we're not going to change anything. That is under, is not something I understand. It doesn't make sense. Talk about the, I don't know, that's just a dumb mindset. So one, I think it's a testament to the relationship we build with our clients that they felt comfortable enough to to call. And we we also provide advice because you know the conversation goes beyond hiring for that one position. Um, again, psychology, and we address this in the book. It, when when a human hears experience, they, they view that in a positive connotation. I'm going to tell you right now, there were SEALs on active duty with 20 years that were absolutely worthless. And while we didn't want to jeopardize their retirement, we put them in positions where they could drive minimal dam damage to the organization, um, which again, violates the concept of, of standards. Uh, but, you know, experience, we're not saying experience is not valuable. It is. If experience was gained in the right manner, right. show me who the, who, who the coaches or mentors were, the system in which he, he or she learned. And if you can validate that, hey, this person is coming from an environment that like is known for producing leaders within those roles, then maybe it's good experience. But if this person didn't understudy under toxic leaders, then most likely they're going to be toxic as well. We also found based off data, which we we went heavy into research, 
that experience is not necessarily necessarily predictive of future performance. And how many times do we, we have somebody who's got 10 years in the company and then all of a sudden we hire some young buck out of college and they come in with fire, curiosity, uh, vigor, and then just start performing. And usually that, that person with 10 years of experience all of a sudden hates that younger individual with no experience saying this person is rocking the boat and I actually disagree. This, this person is coming in and they're, they're showing drive and right. I, why, why would you dislike this, this individual? Maybe they're threatening you. Maybe you're a B player and they're an A player and now you're threatened of what they can do. Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, we do see that quite a bit uh, in our public schools. Uh, you'll see this young, talented person who's got this passion and this drive and, and the, uh, the, uh, the veterans will suck it out of them or, or whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that for another discussion. I do want to ask you this. Uh, you talk about, in your book, you talk about the talent mindset. What is the talent mindset for you? So the, the talent mindset is that it is the, the, the foundational belief that ultimately your people are the greatest asset you have. Can people also be the biggest liability? Assuredly, they can. But at the end of the day, I don't care what industry or, or, or profession you're in, the greatest asset, even though it doesn't show up on the balance sheet, is your people. That's what drives companies, not your technology. That technology was developed by people. It was brought to market by people. So the quality of the team you put on the field will either ensure victory or ensure uh, failure. And George had a great quote that didn't make it into the book. He said, I, I can know when a, an organization has a talent mindset. And he asked this, when you start to look at your human capital with the same rigor, focus, and, and discipline as your financial capital, that's when you know you have a talent mindset. Because most business leaders, you ask them, how often do you check the PL, either daily, every Friday, definitely the end of the month? Well, how often are you doing the nine box? Or how often are you talking about succession planning? Or how, you know... When, when are you pulling in your other leaders to talk about your talent and where you need to pour into people in certain uh, uh, areas or, or, or different departments? And that rarely happens. That rarely happens. And this is why a a very aggressive, you want to call it a CHRO, a, a chief talent officer, a chief people officer. This is why having an A player in that seat who knows every facet of the business and what's required in terms of talent is is vital to a good CEO in growing that company beyond what he thought was imaginable or she thought was imaginable. Absolutely. Uh, your, your talent, your staff, your people, they make or break the company. That's it. I, 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 there isn't, there isn't a, a company out there that we admire that doesn't have a lot of talented people. Let me ask you this. Are, in the book, again, you talk about the hiring process is kind of all messed up. You have a whole chapter dedicated to to the to the uh, the problems or what's so wrong with the traditional hiring process. Talk about this. So th th there's a number of things. Um, you know, we can tell a lot about a company uh, by one how the human resources department is structured. If it reports into legal, it's a, compliant, a compliance function. If it reports into the CFO, the chief financial officer, it, it's an overhead function. If that CHRO, that chief talent officer, that chief, chief people officer reports into the CEO, then there's a chance in hell that it's a strategic function for the business. But there's all, all these pitfalls, you know, uh, the butts and seats mentality. Hey, the economy is booming. Demand is more than we can, we, we can uh, you know, supply right now. We need to make 50 hires. People deviate from their hiring process to fill those seats quickly. And then all of a sudden, the culture feels the uh, the impact. You know, business leaders need to shift their mindset in that your human resources department is, is not an overhead uh, function, which is what 99% of them view it as. It, the 1% that view it as a strategic function. And again, putting an A player in charge of your human resources or your people operations who one has to know every facet of the business more so than anyone in the company. Because if they've got to go work with sales or they need to go work with engineering, they need to know what's required and how engineering operates or the sales department operates. And so they've got to be a student of the uh, the business. 
Um, and, and I'm going to tell you, and I always got to be careful here. There's a lot of HR departments where they basically have an HR practitioner as the CHRO or the VP of, uh, of, of, of uh, HR or talent. And the person is just uh, concerned about compliance and pay and benefits. And that that's necessary. But a great CHRO is more concerned about the maturation, the retention and development of people, and first getting the right people through the uh, the door. So uh, that's a vast difference. And then ultimately to the hiring process, which we call a decisive battlefield, is one, breaking down what's required in every role, knowing what attributes make somebody successful in that role. Because you know what makes somebody successful in sales is vastly different than, than an engineer. And then designing a process around that to pull out those attributes in the behavioral interviews, in the assessments, in, in role-playing, in observation. Um, and then also having that process that's systematic that provides you data as you follow that person through the organization and say, hey, Sally was an amazing hire. We need to break her down. If it was like a machine, reverse engineer and find what truly makes her special and work that into the interview process to go find more Sally's. And it takes time. It takes a lot of intention, commitment, and then you got to continually evolve. What the SEALs looked for in the Vietnam era was different than what they looked for in the global war on terror and is going to be vastly different in what they're looking for in SEALs today that are going to face far more asymmetric challenges that, than we did in the global war on terror. And quite frankly, may also see combat uh, vastly more violent than, than we did. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, Back to what we started at the beginning of the show, uh, we're constantly growing, expanding, changing. It's it's the it's the constant in the universe. In the book, y- you you dedicate a uh, a chapter uh, to explain what makes special operations so special. Talk about this. You know, again, it comes down to mindset. Um, there are really three things that separate special operations. Is uh, one. Uh, you know, we can't hire for previous industry experience. I can't go to a high school or a college and say, who here has special operations experience? Because no hands right. are up. So by nature, we were forced to develop this attribute-based hiring and then design designing a an assessment and selection program, our hiring program, to pull those attributes out. Now, it wasn't the SEALs that 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 really were the uh, the drivers of this. It was actually the Army Special Forces community that started this based off the whole uh, person concept. So number one is attribute-based hiring. Two is that you've got to be able to function as a team player. We have to see that you are selfless, that you can put the needs of the organization above your own. And I don't care if you're an IC, an individual contributor, you are still part of a team moving the the strategy and vision of the company forward uh, that impacts other departments and functions of the business. Three mediocrity is just purely unacceptable. And I mm. say that because I'm thinking of, uh, of a specific outfit in the military uh, I worked with. Um, and, and military does violate this. I just gave you the example of somebody with 18 years in who's just no longer providing value. Hey, we don't want to ruin his retirement. Uh, so we put him in a role where he can, he can drive a little damage. Um, but for the most part, uh, we don't accept mediocrity. And if somebody is not meeting the standard, we're going to pour into them, give them every opportunity to raise their, their, their bar to meet the threshold of our standards. And if they can't, then we have to make the hard decision to actually exit them out of that community, the special operations community. So those are really the three things that make special operations so special. It's not the technology. It's, it's not the, the, the resources. At the end of the day, the greatest weapon system in the military and in life is the human weapon system. That's that's what each human is. That is the ultimate weapon. And I, I know as we got AI coming in and saying AI is going to replace fighter pilots, we'll see. We will see. Because the fighter pilots I've met are exceptional human beings. Right. Um, I, I have no doubt that AI can replicate their their uh their capacity to 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 maneuver a jet plane, but AI is going to lack empathy. It's gonna, yes. it's gonna lack, uh, you know, uh, just those those human qualities of is this the right thing to do, not just following in order. Absolutely. All right. So let me ask you this. First of all, real quick, I agree with everything you said. I, I love this idea of 
attribute based hiring. I think that should be a model. Uh, but in every organization, including the military, you're going to come across a situation where maybe uh, two people can't get along, right? The, they're, they're both talented, they're both good leaders, but for whatever reason, their chemistry doesn't allow them to get along. What do you do in a situation like that? Okay. If, if you know, the, the private sector is no different than the military. Most relationships are arranged marriages. I didn't right. get to select the 40 <laughs> SEALs in my troop. I was, I, was, I was assigned to this unit and the SEALs in it are the SEALs in it. Right. So, you know, what I didn't talk about in the talent war was I'm a believer in the, you know, people ask, how'd you lead in the military? I led from the heart. The greatest form of leadership is love. And the highest form of compassion uh, or love is accountability. And for the parents listening, you know what I'm talking about. Because at the end of the day, whether you're leading people in a company or your children, we want to maturate them. We want to coach and mentor them to become kind, empathetic, respectful, competent human beings who contribute to society or the organization, but more importantly, become better than we are, which means stressing their, their critical thinking, helping them learn from their mistakes because we're not going to be around forever. And that's truly what creates what I call an unbroken chain of excellence, which a great book um, uh, is Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal. Phenomenal transformational leader. Um, but, you know, people like, oh, well, you must have, you know, liked all the SEALs you served with. I uh, And my answer is absolutely not. Not all of them like me. And guess what? That's fine. I love them all. Did I like them all? No. Now, this is just being a professional. Whether you like somebody or not, those are your feelings and you need as a professional to put those aside and ask yourself, do I have the ability to come in on Monday morning knowing what we need to achieve for that week and work with this individual for the good of the organization? And this comes down to professionalism. And if you can't do that, that's usually a you problem, not the other person problem. I don't care if they're abrasive. Trust me, there's a lot of SEALs that were abrasive, that were sure. loud guys. And, and I'm just going to put my ego aside, work with them in the degree that I can to accomplish the mission. And then guess what? Come Friday, you can go your separate paths. Never, never shall they meet on the weekend and, and then just do the same thing again on Monday. So if I was a leader and two people came in, they're like, we just can't work together. They would get a come to Jesus uh, speech from me. And it may, if you're forcing me to make a decision like he needs to go or she needs to go, I, I, I'll probably go with you. Okay. Is that, is that what you guys want me to do? You, you 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 can't work together. You're both relieved. You're out. You just demonstrated to me a, a lack of maturity and professionalism that, quite frankly, I'm not going to allow to 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 poison this culture. And it'll send yeah. a message to everyone else. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a great solution because it does send a message. It does tell everybody culture comes before anything else. If because if the culture becomes toxic or weak, then the company becomes toxic or weak. So I like that solution. And I think, I think more, uh, HR people and more CEOs need to take that, uh, need to take that to heart. The, the goat Willie Nelson once said, let people be people. It's their greatest strength. Hey, if somebody's a genuinely authentic jerk, just let them be that jerk. If they're, if they're still providing to the organization, who, who am I to be the arbiter on, uh, on somebody's, uh, personality? Um, unless they're just destroying the culture, they're being toxic and, and making unethical uh, decisions, then we have a problem. But if they're not doing that and they're just a loud individual, that's just their personality. Let them do it. And, and if I need to chip away at that through some mentorship and coaching, then then I'll do that. Yes, absolutely. I want to I wanna ask you this real quick. I know we're getting tight on time, but I do want to talk about the nine fundamental character attributes of talent. These are the nine that you look for. Talk about this. So uh, you're, you're putting me on the spot and I'm going to pull them up. I just briefed this uh, yesterday. Uh, it's it's quite all right. So you've probably got the list in front of you. First off, uh, drive. Um, drive is uh, fundamental to, to success. If somebody's not driven, you're, you're going to have real problems. I'd rather pull somebody back than have to drive them forward. Uh, another one is team ability. I said it earlier, you have to have the ability to put the needs of the organization above yourself. We're not saying that we don't want you to take care of yourself. Uh, you know, the, the hardest lesson I learned, and I learned it too late, is that as a leader, sometimes you need to be a little bit selfish 
and take care of yourself so that you show up as 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 the well-rounded uh, leader that your people need you to be. Um, you know, uh, curiosity. Curiosity is is that drive in the gut that makes you always challenge the way you've done things. Is there a way to do it better? Can we can we learn as an organization and get better? Uh, get better. Effective intelligence. I love this one. This actually came from the Marine Corps, the Marsoc community. They said, "Yeah, IQ does matter. Intellectual horsepower does matter. But the ability to apply what intelligence you have to solve real world problems for which no book solutions exist. Integrity." Yes or no. And let me say trust. Trust, there's multiple lines of trust. And I've learned this from a mentor who was coaching me recently. He said, hey, Mike, clearly you don't trust the person in this facet, but do you trust them here, here, and here? And I'm like, yeah, well, yes. And he's like, as a professional, you need to be able to accept that. We had an old saying in the military, I can trust this man, this man with my life, but not my money and my wife. So it's a perfect example of like separating, yeah, I don't trust him here, but on the battlefield, he's got my, my back. And he can do his job uh, extremely, uh, extremely well. Um, where, where did I leave off? Um, read them off to me if you got them. All right. So we have drive, resiliency. Resiliency, we hit that. It's, hey, you're going to get knocked down. I need people who are going to get back up. It's that famous uh, Rocky Balboa speech, I think in Rocky yeah. Five, where he's like, it's not, it's not how hard you can punch, but how hard you can get punched and keep, and moving. keep moving forward. Adaptability. COVID was a perfect example. There, there's no, there was no textbook for how to deal with COVID, but having the ability to adapt in the environment, not to survive, but to thrive. What else? Emotional strength, I think, is the last one we haven't covered. Yeah, EQ. Um, you know, your ability to regulate your emotions and, and not have such highs and lows is vital as a leader. When everything's exploding around you, when guys are wounded, do you remain calm? Because remaining calm is infectious. If your men and women, your subordinates see you, and even during the worst of times, you're taking a breath, you look at them and say, hey, guys, we're going right. And they'll maneuver and they'll actually replicate that, 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 that calmness. But if you're running around like a chicken with their head cut off, then what do you think your people are going to do? And then that's where you have no effectiveness in volatile environments. So your ability to regulate your emotion also has to deal with relationships. Again, you work with somebody you don't like, control your emotions and just always take the higher ground. Yes. And and look, even in some of our families, <laughs> you know, we we love some of these people that we really don't like or don't get along with. You talked about not getting along with your dad. Look, I didn't get along with my dad uh, until much later in life. And, and it's, just just part of life. You got to deal with people you don't like. Yeah, well, you, you know, it's not that we didn't like our dads. Um, right. we, 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 we idolize our parents, then we uh, demonize our parents as teenagers, and then yes. you demonize them again uh, as you mature. And you're like, hey, you know what? Actually, you're trying to, uh, to, to teach me, to matter me, uh, to show me the right way of do, doing things, sometimes through stories about how they failed and they didn't want you to replicate it. So that that's pretty common. Um, yes. My old man is a good, as well as my mom, good, good human being. And bro, we get it wrong. We 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 are we're you know like two peas in a pod now. And he's the guy I call for advice, especially since he was he was successful as a business leader. Of hey, dude, I, I'm only five years retired. Uh, I'm running this company. I'm in this situation, Dad. What would you do in my my uh, my shoes? And he'll give me the best advice that he can, given the uh, context of the situation. I love that. I love that. All right. Speaking of uh, situations, who are the best clients for you? Are you talking a startup? Are you talking a five man team? Are you talking a fifty man company or a thousand man company? Who's your sweet spot? Uh, you, I say small to medium sized businesses. It doesn't matter where they are in the 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 life cycle of business. If it's a startup mode, we just know we need to find people that can. Uh, operate with little process and procedure and maybe start to put it in place as they grow, but are highly resilient because we all know startup is like just getting punched in the junk every single day um, <laughs> who are resilient. And then also, again, get back to that uh, emotional regulation, that emotional intelligence of just knowing that you're going to continually get punk punched in the junk and you, you, you just, 
you're even keel, you're level. Hey, this is going to happen. What what matters is how we respond, not getting uh, ramped up by 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 a failure or or a hit. Yeah, I love that. I love that. All right, listen, I got one last question. I should have asked you this earlier, but it, it got past me. Uh, do you miss it? Do you miss? Here you are. You retired for a while now. Do you miss the? rush of going to war? Do you miss doing missions and battles? Do you miss all that? 100%. And I think anyone who says no is is lying. Um, there was something about, and I know the guys around me, we all knew the, the, the price uh, of war and the families pay the cost. We knew that. And there, there was a selfishness about us that we wanted to go forward. And we knew that meant we left our families and our kids, but we also had a sense of purpose. So to be surrounded with men and women that just had this mindset and this sense of purpose. And at the end of the day, and I was just talking to uh, a 75th Ranger Regiment buddy who I deployed with in 2010, uh, just an exceptional human being, West Point, a uh, highly successful entrepreneur. It was the fact that war was simple. Like I didn't care about how much I was getting paid. Uh, didn't care about the bills because I knew those were on auto pay. Um, you had this high sense of purpose. You did miss the thrill of as a team, you knew you were going after very bad people. You knew you were going to get in a, a, a firefight. And at the worst of times, that's at, that's when we were at our very best. And I miss that, that homecoming and belonging. I miss that tribe, that camaraderie, uh, what the Marine Corps calls the esprit de corps. And quite frankly, I'm never going to have that again. And that's the, the the transitional challenge of of starting to recognize, hey, I was lucky that I even got that in my life to feel that such that that's such a sense of brotherhood that ninety nine point nine percent of humans will never feel. And so, it's taken me a while, and I'm only six years retired. Uh, that I'm one of the fortunate ones. I'm one of the fortunate ones that I did come home. But I got to feel that sense of brotherhood that very that humans just don't feel that that it's an emotional intimacy. Right. But that's what I miss. And and quite frankly, we 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 really believed in what we were doing. If we if the American public who's been somewhat sheltered from some of the things we've seen, the videotapes we would recover and the atrocities that Islamic terrorists conduct on innocent people, we we were we were laser focused on what we were doing and why we were there. And so I don't want to say it was fun, but there was a lot of purpose behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike, if somebody wanted to find out more about you or hire you as a speaker, as a consultant, what's the website they go to? MikeSorelli.com, which, uh, God, I guess low in modesty. Uh, <laughs> my, my agents are like, hey, you need a website. So I had to create MikeSorelli.com, not not the highlight or, or, or uh, I consider a, uh, a high point in my life, but MikeSorelli.com, people can find me and then find uh, the other ventures I got going on. Through great, that. great. You know, we didn't get we didn't get to talk to you about your other book, Everyday Warrior. I'd love to bring you back at another time. Talk about Everyday Warrior uh, because it's I think that's important as well. Mike, thank you so much for stopping by today. Hey, Bert, thank you for having me. This has been a great conversation. I've learned so. Thank you for your time.